Chapter 9 of Among the Pond People. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Ingle. Among the Pond People by Clara Dillingham Pearson. The Dragonfly Children and the Snapping Turtle. The dragonflies have always lived near the pond, not the same ones that are there now, of course, but the great-great-great-grandfathers of these. A person would think that, after a family had lived so long in a place, all the neighbors would be fond of them, yet it is not so. The dragonflies may be very good people, and even the snapping turtle says that they are. Still, they are so peculiar that many of their neighbors do not like them at all. Even when they are only larvae, or babies, they are not good playmates, for they have such a bad habit of putting everything into their mouths. Indeed, the stickleback father once told the little sticklebacks that they should not stir out of the nest unless they would promise to keep away from the young dragonflies. The stickleback mother said that it was all the fault of the dragonfly mothers. "'What can you expect?' exclaimed one of them, when dragonfly eggs are so carelessly laid. I saw a dragonfly mother laying some only yesterday, and how do you suppose she did it? Just flew around in the sunshine and visited with her friends, and once in a while flew low enough to touch the water and drop one in. It is disgraceful. The minnow mothers did not think it was so much in the way the eggs were laid. Although, said one, I always lay mine close together instead of scattering them over the whole pond. They thought the trouble came from bad bringing up, or no bringing up at all. Each egg, you know, when it is laid, drops to the bottom of the pond, and the children are hatched and grow up there, and do not even see their fathers and mothers. Now, most of the larvae were turning into nymphs, which are half-grown dragonflies. They had been short and plump, and now they were longer and more slender, and there were little bunches on their shoulders where the wings were growing under their skin. They had outgrown their old skins a great many times, and had to wriggle out of them to be at all comfortable. When a dragonfly child became too big for his skin, he hooked the two sharp claws of each of his six feet firmly into something, unfastened his skin down the back, and wriggled out, leaving it to roll around in the water until it became just part of the mud. Like most growing children, the dragonfly larvae and nymphs had to eat a great deal. Their stomachs were as long as their bodies, and they were never really happy unless their stomachs were full. They always ate plain food, and plenty of it, and they never ate between meals. They had breakfast from the time they awakened in the morning until the sun was high in the sky. Then they had dinner until the sun was low in the sky, and supper from that time until it grew dark, and they went to sleep. But never a mouthful between meals, no matter how hungry they might be. They said this was their only rule about eating, and they would keep it. They were always slow children. You would think that, with six legs apiece and three joints in each leg, they might walk quite fast, yet they never did. When they had to, they hurried in another way by taking a long leap through the water. Of course they breathed water like their neighbors, the fishes, and the tadpoles. They did not breathe it into their mouths or through gills, but took it in through some openings in the back part of their bodies. When they wanted to hurry, they breathed this water out so suddenly that it sent them quickly ahead. The snapping turtle had called them bothering bugs one day when he was cross, and that was the day after he had been cross and just before the day when he was going to be cross again. And they didn't like him, and wanted to get even. They all put their queer little three-cornered heads together, and there was an ugly look in their great staring eyes. "'Horrid old thing!' said one larva. "'I wish I could sting him!' "'Well, you can't,' said a nymph, turning towards him so suddenly that he leaped. "'You haven't any sting, and you never will have, so just keep still.' It was not at all nice in her to speak that way, but she was not well brought up, you know, and that, perhaps, 
is a reason why one should excuse her for talking so to her little brother. She was often impatient and said she could never go anywhere without one of the larvae tagging along. I tell you what let's do, said another nymph. Let's all go together to the shallow water where he suns himself, and let's all stand close to each other, and then when he comes along, let's stick out our lips at him. Both lips? asked the larvae. Well, our lower lips anyway, answered the nymph. Our upper lips are so small they don't matter. We'll do it, exclaimed all the dragonfly children, and they started together to walk on the pond bottom to the shallow water. They thought it would scare the snapping turtle dreadfully. They knew that whenever they stuck out their lowered lips at the small fishes and bugs, they swam away as fast as they could. The giant water bug, Bellistoma, was the only bug who was not afraid of them when they made faces. Indeed, the lower lip of a dragonfly child might well frighten people, for it is fastened on a long, jointed, arm-like thing and has pincers on it with which it catches and holds its food. Most of the time, the dragonfly child keeps the joint bent and so holds his lip up to his face like a mask. But sometimes he straightens the joint and holds his lip out before him, and then its pincers catch hold of things. He does this when he is hungry. When they reached the shallow water, the dragonfly children stood close together, with the larvae in the middle and the nymphs all around them. The snappy turtle was nowhere to be seen, so they had to wait. "'Aren't you scared?' whispered one larva to another. "'Scared? Duh! Who's afraid?' answered he. "'Oh, look!' cried a nymph. "'There go some grown-up dragonflies over our heads. "'Just you wait until I change my skin once more, "'and then won't I have a good time. "'I'll dry my wings, and then I'll... "'Shh!' said one of the larvae. "'Here comes the snappy turtle!' "'Sure enough, there he came through the shallow water, "'his wet back shell partly out of it "'and shining in the sunlight. "'He came straight toward the dragonfly children, "'and they were glad to see that he did not look hungry.' They thought he might be going to take a nap after his dinner. Then they all stood even closer together and stuck out their lower lips at him. They thought he might run away when they did this. They felt sure he would at least be very badly frightened. The snapping turtle did not seem to see them at all. It was queer. He just waddled on and on, coming straight toward them. "'Oh,' said he, "'how sleepy I do feel!' I will lie down in the sunshine and rest. He took a few more steps, which brought his great body right over the crowd of dragonfly children. I think I will draw in my head, said he. The dragonfly children looked at each other. And my tail. Here, two of the youngest larvae began to cry. And lie down. He began to draw on his legs very, very slowly, and just as his great hard lower shell touched the mud, the last larva crawled out under his tail. The nymphs had already gotten away. Oh, said the dragonfly children to each other, wasn't it awful? Humph, said the snapping turtle, talking to himself. He had gotten into the way of doing that because he had so few friends. How dreadfully they did scare me. Then he laughed a grim, snapping turtle laugh and went to sleep. End of chapter 9 Recording by Jill Ingle